Hi, my name is Lily Ponitz. I'm a DeKalb County resident, a former environmental engineer, and a current student at Georgia State University. I'm making this video today, September 3rd, because in four days, the Atlanta City Council is voting on leasing the former uh, Atlanta City Prison Farm property to the Atlanta Police Foundation for development into a, a police training center. And I think it's important to provide context about the history of this land and the area in South DeKalb and the decisions that have led us to today um, to hopefully uh, convince council members to vote no on Tuesday uh, because this is not the right site, it's not the right time. And um, so let's get started. Let's start with the land and let's start at the beginning. The Atlanta City Prison Farm property is on naturally resource rich land that has been inhabited since the Archaic period. That's sometime at least 4,000 years ago. The property is less than a mile north of the South River, which is the northernmost boundary of Soapstone Ridge. Soapstone Ridge is the largest intrusion of mafic, ultramafic rock in North Georgia and home to several natural springs. The rock formations, like mineral resources throughout history, proved to be important to human settlement. In the 1980s, Georgia State University conducted extensive archaeological surveys and found sites where people lived, harvested soapstone, and worked the stone into bowls and tools. They found evidence of quarrying and bowl making on sides of boulders, and current residents offered broken and unfinished bowls that they collected in the area. Production of soapstone bowls, mostly for cooking, was likely a focus of economic activity in this community. Eventually, ceramic pottery began to coexist with soapstone bowls, and thousands of years later, completely overtook the old technology. I'll continue on to the next phase of the land's inhabitants. The Creek Indians, along with the Cherokees, came to what is now the state of Georgia over a thousand years ago. This is a quote from the Porch Creek Indians who are descendants of the original Creek Nation and live on their tribal lands in and around the reservation in Porch, Alabama. It is said that centuries ago, our ancestors came from the West, descending from the mountains. The creator sent down a cedar pole and instructed our people to stand the pole upright and travel in the direction it fell. They followed it for countless days and nights as each day the pole fell east. Finally, they reached the coast with an endless ocean before them. They asked the creator if they were to live here and were told to follow the pole one more day and night. The pole fell west and they followed. At dawn, they discovered a rich and fertile land teeming with life. The sacred pole stood upright. They had reached their home. The early Creeks discovered fertile river bottomlands and built an economy based on farming, hunting, and fishing. The Creek Nation expanded over almost all of what is present-day Alabama and Georgia. In 1540, members of Hernando de Soto's expedition encountered the Creek people for the first time. Characteristic of these early contacts, the Creeks were devastated by foreign diseases and inadequate resources to support the expedition's food and supply demands. Later, in the 1600s, the British began trading in Creek territory, and in 1733, they established the Georgia colony along the banks of the Savannah River. During the Revolutionary War, despite conflict with the British and many Creeks wanting to remain neutral, the Creek Nation formed an alliance with England. In 1783, after losing the Revolutionary War, the British ceded Creek territory to the new country. New waves of American settlers poured into Creek territory, many coveting the rich river bottom lands that were possessed by the Creeks. That same year, the state of Georgia negotiated an illegal treaty at Augusta, taking Creek lands from the Ogeechee to the Oconee River. As time went on and the cotton industry expanded, frontier settlers' desire for the Creek's fertile land intensified. The Creeks continued to thrive, establishing businesses along trails that connected the Upper Creeks in Alabama and the Lower Creeks in present-day Georgia. In 1805, in the Treaty of Washington, the Creeks allowed the government to widen one trail into a federal road. This road became a major thoroughfare for the migration of settlers. Under pressure from the government and hostility from their settler neighbors, internal conflict arose among the Creeks, as well as the Choctaws and Cherokees. Some sided with the more northern Shawnee leaders in resisting assimilation and resisting giving up more land. In 1813, war broke out between the coalition of resistors and the loyalists who were backed by General Andrew Jackson. And this lasted until a Georgia militia, together with federal troops, destroyed a stronghold of Creeks at Horseshoe Bend in the Tallapoosa River uh, in Alabama. This violent attack killed many of the resistance and convinced Creek towns to side with Jackson. 
As punishment for their resistance, in 1814, America took a significant portion of land from the Greeks, 23 million acres, including southern Georgia bordering Florida. Then in 1821, in the first Treaty of Indian Springs, the Creeks ceded their lands between the Okmulgee River and the Flint River to America and the growing state of Georgia. This is the land that DeKalb County is founded on in 1822. By 1860, the land, which at this point had been freely inhabited by indigenous people for thousands of years, was subdivided and sold by DeKalb County to individual property holders. Over the next 50 years, we begin to see the river bottom lands be converted into large plantations, the mineral deposits turned into industrial quarries, and the railroad tracks laid. DeKalb County's historical maps show the city of Atlanta taking over ownership of the future prison farm site by 1915. I won't use this time to dive into the Atlanta City Prison Farm operation. Instead, I'm going to link an article in the video description that was just published on August 13th by the Atlanta Community Press Collective and we'll cover that period in detail. The purpose of this video is to start to unpack how cities reacted to the establishment of the Atlanta City Prison Farm. I raise questions about how the legacy of this facility has influenced the last 40 years of government decisions, which collectively have left us with a dire ecological and archeological situation in this part of DeKalb, as well as left residents feeling excluded and disengaged. The city of Atlanta Dairy Farm, this was the original name for the prison farm, appears on a roadway map in 1937, as does the US government Honor Farm. The city's prison farm has long been confused with this federally owned Honor Farm, even though the two properties are completely separate. This misinformation came from a city of Atlanta planner's report that was published in 1999 that combined se selected information from multiple farm sites and painted the prison farm in a favorable light. The neighborhood surrounding the prison farm became to be called Constitution. By 1945, Constitution was listed as an incorporated city, and the Atlanta City Prison Farm was within the limits of Constitution. Constitution was rural as compared to spatially similar incorporated cities, which were considered suburbs to Atlanta, such as Decatur and Avondale Estates. In 1981, a DeKalb Extra journalist interviewed residents, and no one could recall the origin story of Constitution or a reason why it was incorporated. It is here I must question the influence of the prison farm on the development of the city in title only, and wonder if that influence extended beyond Constitution into South DeKalb. Could proximity to the prison farm site have dissuaded developers from building new residential developments in this area? Could DeKalb County have intentionally or, un or unintentionally disinvested in this area, tacitly allowing it to be outpaced in terms of modern infrastructure and technology? How is a city or community's retelling of their own history influenced by the presence of police and prisons as agents of surveillance and incarceration and enforcers of security? In the 1980s, even as archaeologists were just beginning to uncover habitations on Soapstone Ridge, DeKalb was expanding commercially into this area. Talk began of registering Soapstone Ridge as an archaeological district, either nationally or locally, to preserve the unique natural and cultural history. Efforts to list this area started and stopped until 1997, when Soapstone Ridge was nominated as a historic district in DeKalb County. At this point, the applicants were making a plea. It is our contention that current development, if allowed to continue at its present rate, will destroy all vestiges of the Soapstone Ridge sites within 30 years, and that preservation of the information in these sites, as well as preservation of the sites themselves when possible, is necessary to avoid losing the highly significant information. Soapstone Ridge is listed as a historic district today, but with so few people aware of its existence and surrounded by commercial development, this valuable cultural resource is disappearing. As recently as 2006, DeKalb County Planning and Sustainability Department updated their archaeological guidelines for Soapstone Ridge Historic District. However, no such document can be found online today. There are only two sentences about the district on DeKalb County's website. Why would the county roll back archaeological guidelines for a historic district? Why was there so much resistance in the first place to registering Soapstone Ridge? Fast forwarding to today, commercial interests still appear to dominate the political discourse around the prison farm site in South DeKalb. Government has supported the growth of interstate trucking business and film studios, which has had an obvious negative effect on the surrounding landscape. 
Neighbors of Black Hall Studios observed a well-visited lake completely filling in with silt over the time the two huge Black Hall film studios were built. Now on the former prison farm site, which has been abandoned, blighted, and a safety hazard for the community for decades, the Atlanta City Council and Atlanta Police Foundation are attempting to build a new police training facility. The Atlanta Police Foundation, or APF, has claimed publicly that an environmental site assessment has been done before they proposed their conceptual plan. Where is this document? Because as an environmental professional, I know without a doubt that a proper phase one environmental site assessment would have raised questions about in-ground contamination from the previous operations, unmarked graves, hazardous building materials, and illegal, illegal dumping sites. There are other phase one ESA reports that we can look to for similar prison and agricultural sites. Take for example, the former Hillcrest Youth Correctional Facility in Salem, Oregon. This property was occupied by a state correctional facility beginning in 1913 and had field crops and orchards from the 1930s through the 1980s. Very similar time frame to the Atlanta City Prison Farm. An environmental site assessment was completed in 2017 for this site and found several things that warranted further investigation, including underground heating oil tanks and potential leaks, pesticide residues in the soils, lead in the soils, unidentified potentially hazardous trash dumped on site and related soil contamination, hazardous building materials such as asbestos and lead paint, and potential for historic septic fields to be present and present a hazard during redevelopment. After the Atlanta City Prison Farm shut down, the Atlanta Police Department built a firing range on this property, and munitions debris and metals contamination in Entrenchment Creek have been documented for several years now, and that's an additional issue that we have at this site as compared to the Hillcrest site. So while I see how APF may have commissioned a small site assessment to check the box on and say they understand the environmental hazards of developing the former prison farm site, I think that the Atlanta City Council should be asking for a full phase one environmental site assessment that follows EPA best standards before they sign any kind of lease. I fear that the council members are being too quick to jump to a I support the police position before these November elections and um, they're missing some really important implications of this deal. It is not in the city's best interest to take the risk of leasing land that consists of soil and water that may have been contaminated by the city's own historical operations. It's not in the city's best interest to lease land for development that may contain unmarked graves, the likelihood of which is explained in the article that's in the video description. Imagine APF coming back to council in three years for a new site because they started digging and found human remains. Is that really a scenario that the city council wants to make possible? I might be ending this video in a dark place, but that's because that's where I think this situation is with the prison farm site. It's very dark right now. We have governments who have either intentionally or not been burying information about the historical and archaeological significance of this region in DeKalb County. And we have a non-governmental foundation funded by the wealthiest class and whitest neighborhoods of this city urgently lobbying city council to sign a lease and turn over the land to them. What are we supposed to think of this as citizens? To me, it looks like no actors in this care about community impacts of these decisions. What about the researchers who spent countless years of their lives uncovering Soapstone Ridge and the planners who labored over the standards for archaeological preservation just to have DeKalb County throw it away? What about the activists in Atlanta who have been putting in work for years and years to sway politicians' opinions on investment in the prison industrial complex? People who thought that they were making progress and now are seeing how sensational media and high profile crimes can drive a fear among city leaders that perhaps the right path is not towards decarceration and smaller police budgets. That's why I'm making this video to add context to the discussion and perhaps change perceptions of the urgency of this situation. I'm asking why jump on this site? Why jump on this plan and this set of stakeholders at this time with all of the risks when nothing has really changed to force us to act. I'm making the plea for time and investigative effort from the city council before we sign this land away and sign away our right to protecting its ecological, cultural, and archeological value.
Thanks so much for watching. I haven't made a video like this in a long time and I had to create this in just a couple of days uh, and it was fun. So expect more from me, expect more from this channel. And uh, this is a collaborative space I'm trying to initiate. So um, if you wanna contribute or collaborate on something, um, definitely message me. And if you like this, then subscribe, um, send me a message, leave a comment. Uh, I would appreciate that so much. So um, remember to act, uh, call in on Monday, Labor Day, this September 6th, 4 to 7 p.m. Um, there's a link for the phone number to the Atlanta City Council in the description. Um, you can also find your district in Atlanta or DeKalb um, and your representative's contact info with those links. Um, and tons of resources, um, check those out if you wanna know more about uh, this issue. And um, please join me in doing everything that you can to stop Cop City. Thanks.